Buenas tardes, me llamo Carla Stelbeck, soy de origen este, holandesa, europea, y este, vine a vivir a México a los 16 años, hice mi carrera primero acá, y después me fui a Nueva York, donde sigo en la Universidad de School of Visual Arts, y la ponencia mía se llama The Singular Case of Julio Galán, 1970s to Today, Neo-Mexicanism, NAFTA Art, and Neoliberalism. Rather, it is an attempt to re-examine or recontextualize the case of Julio Galán's career <clears throat> from the perspective of an analysis of my 50-year archives, which cover many temporalities that in turn have influenced and coincided those that shaped our understanding or reading of Galán's career. The only distinction is that Galán passed away in 2006 at the age of 48 years, allowing us to re-situate the significance, his significance rather, by examining the various moments of neo-Mexicanism, NAFTA art, and neoliberalism from 2006 to today, 2022. The antecedents are that in the late 1970s, when I decided and edited Artes Visuales at the Museo de Arte Moderno in Mexico City, I often traveled to Monterrey. On one of those occasions, I met Julio Galán when I would visit Doña Marga Garzazada of the Grupo Alfa. She was closely involved in the creation of the Museo Rufino Tamayo that Fernando Gamboa and myself, director of the Museo de Arte Moderno, were working on as well at that time. Besides being an admirer of Tamayo's work, Margara was the prime force behind Grupo Alfa's collection and their visual arts program. In order to gain major international exposure Grupo Alfa's culture of Grupo Alfa's cultural endeavors, she contracted a multi-year one-page ad in Artes Visuales. As of issue number eight in 1975, I began selling ads hoping to raise enough funds for Artes Visuales to become independent of the Instituto Nacional de Bellas Artes y Literatura, who subsidized the budget. Alas, that was not to happen. Instead, in December of 1981, the magazine was censored by the newly appointed director of visual arts at the IMBA when President López Portillo was on his way out and Miguel de la Madrid was elected next president of Mexico in January of 1982. During his last State of the Union address, López Portillo, who had been president of Mexico since 1976, decreed the nationalization of banks as, an, as a measure to stop the flight of capital, which had surpassed $30 million. In hindsight, it was a desperate decision whose outcome forced the delivery of banks to foreign capital during the 1990s, as well as two decades of economic stagnancy. And to make matters worse, the Mexican banks were again privatized during the administration of Carlos Salinas de Gortari from 1988 to 1994, who sold them to stockbrokers used to speculative investment. This time it took the banks to bankruptcy in order to sell them to foreign banks. At present, there's only two banks in Mexico that are owned by Mexicans. It is Bambajillo and Banorte. All of these factors, plus the rise of neoliberal free market initiatives in the U.S. and worldwide, had set the stage for the Salinas de Gortari's campaign, both in Mexico and the U.S., to promote the signing of NAFTA. All of these political and economic circumstances were the backdrop against which my relationship, both professional and personal, with Julio Galán developed. The archival sources that I'm using. Researching my 50-year professional archive, it became clear that <clears throat> among his generation, Julio Galán's career in Mexico and worldwide was and continues to be a singular case. It covers many temporalities from Mexico's pre-NAFTA beginnings to what became later known as a neo-Mexicanism art in the 1990s and late and into the 1990s. Sorry, into the 1980s to the 1990s. All the way through the signing of NAFTA and the advent of neoliberalism in Mexico and Latin America. 
and the singularity includes his <coughs> posthumous presence, which in the aftermath of neoliberalism's devastating economic and political results, continue to influence the arts and cultural sectors in Mexico and elsewhere. And like many of the other protagonists of the neo-Mexicanism movement, Galan's work continues to be exhibited. And just recently, the Museo Tamayo opened the exhibition Julio Galan, Un Conejo Partido a la Mitad, in June, of, June the 4th of this year, till, and it just closed on September the 4th. Why this ongoing interest? Is it the south of the border queerness his blatant narcissism coupled with an eye for unsettling kitsch, embracing with equal comfort the attitudes of both boy and girl, as though an uninhabited child let loose in a wardrobe. These questions prompted me to research my archives of Julio. In addition, I found several others I worked with closely during the 1980s and 90s, the heyday of neo-Mexicanism, including some that I continue to work with on occasion. Monterrey. Besides visiting Margarita in Monterrey, I took the opportunity to do the rounds and catch up with the arts and cultural life of that city. And on one of those trips, Margarita suggested I visit the Galleria Miro, located in downtown Monterrey, close to where today the Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Monterrey, Marco, was later built. Galeria Miro turned out to be a space that combined a well-stocked bookshop with spectacular antiques plus contemporary art. It was owned by Guillermo Sepulveda, Memo. Besides being Margarita's son-in-law at that time, Memo was a tastemaker of sorts the Monterrey elite listened to. After introductions, we went into his office and there, on the floor, reclined against bookshelves, I noticed a group of small figurative paintings. They immediately caught my eye. I thought there was a certain kinship with the poupée of Hans Belmer. It was I was captivated and intrigued to find these unusual images in Monterrey. It seemed that besides Belmer, Julio Galán combined references of a provincial childhood with homoerotic allegory crafting oneric nostalgic dreamscapes in which his self-portraits self represented a dandified, effeminate artist. Julio is from Musquiz, Coahuila, studying architecture here in town, Memo said, adding they had only just met a couple of days before when Julio brought his paintings. I was look, looking at the floor. Can I meet him? I asked, whereupon Memo called Julio, who invited me immediately uh, to his house in Garza Garcia neighborhood. Julio was a mesmerizing figure. I mean, he was totally charming. So I was really happy that he invited me. And I took a taxi and upon arrival met him as well as his mother. This must have been in 1978 or 79. And after a few moments of small talk, we went into his, his part of the house and entered a large, beautifully furnished bedroom with lots of books, plus some more of the, of the small paintings I had seen. They were equally disquieting as those that were at the Galleria Miro. We then went into an adjacent small seating area with a work table and sketchbooks, assorted art materials, and several <clears throat> raw canvases. I spotted a box of exquisitely painted tar antique tarot cards, which prompted Julio to offer to do a reading. He was completely at ease interpreting, interpreting the symbolism and elaborated extensively on each card that I picked. I was mesmerized by his imagination and his baby face and his knack for fantasy as well as his demeanor, which was shy yet inspired translucent. He was all lit up. Then I had to leave for another appointment at my hotel, but we promised to meet one another the following afternoon. This time I invited him to go together to see Death in Venice, and note, which I had noticed was playing in one of Monterrey's theaters. After the film, Julio suggested we have dinner at a local restaurant. And once there, he asked me what I thought the film was about. 
I was perplexed. How come he hadn't picked up on Visconti's film Queerness, in which the actor Dirk Bogard, in the middle of a wave of cholera, obsesses over a gorgeous Venetian young boy. I explained as delicately as I could, thinking perhaps Julio had not come out of the closet, or he didn't understand what the Thomas Mann's book was about. Today, in hindsight, it may have been Julio's way of teasing or perhaps testing me. Before parting, I mentioned I'd like to approach some Mexico City art world people who might be as interested as I was in his work and would need slides, which he said he could bring to the hotel next morning. <coughs> Prior to my departure from Mexico City, <coughs> sorry, Julio stopped by the hotel where over coffee we discussed his works. The slides clearly demonstrated how removed from the lyrical abstraction most Mexico City artists favored at that time, his work unequivocally embraced representation and gender. Once back at the MAM, Museo de Arte Moderno, I made a date to go see Armando Colina and Victor Acuña at their Galleria Arvil, where a year or two prior, with Francisco Toledo and several critics, we introduced Enrique Guzman's works. I thought Julio's work shared a similar sensibility to Guzman, a sui generis surrealist iconography characterized by a constant projection of female figures, knives, shoes, solitary rooms, even mental labyrinths, and a reflected deep sadness as Guzman suffered endemic depression. Arville was very successful showing and selling Guzman's work to Mexico City collectors, whose endemic, but his endemic depression, despite his success, Guzman committed suicide at age 34 in 1986. During the six months I spent going back and forth from Artes Visuales to the Museo Tamayo, with Galeria Arvid's interest in showing Julio's work, we scheduled his first ever exhibition in Mexico City in 1982. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there for the opening. However, when I called the following day, Julio and the Arvilles were very excited, since several prominent Mexican art world personalities, like Mary Stewart and her husband, the diplomat Carlos Bernal, as well as the author Carlos Monsivais, had bought his work on the spot, plus more were in reserve. Julio's show was the talk of the town, a huge success. New York City. After Julio's opening at Arville and at another one-person show of Arte Actual Mexicano in 1982, and after leaving the Museo Arte Moderno and the Tamayo Museum, I went to New York City, where I received by express mail the invitation for his show, Los Pensamientos Secretos de Julio Galán. It was made of forest green cardboard and had a small cut-out window that when you opened it, a door led to another door and so on and so on, endless. In the left corner was a bear's claw, and on the cover of the invite, Julio wrote, Carla, Carla, siempre estarás en ellos. Te quiere, te quiere, Julio. Translated, it would say, Carla, Carla, you will always be in them. Love you, love you, love you, Julio. Also at that time in New York City, I began to work with Alejandro Colunga, another protege of Margara and Memo, who were his prime collectors at that time. I was able to secure a huge commission of a ceramic sculpture in the lobby of a new first ever Spanish speaking network on West 42nd Street in New York City for Colunga. The network was created and directed by René Anselmo, who was a partner of Emilio Azcarra Milmo, the owner of Mexico City. Mexico City-based powerful Televisa network, and on the occasion of a trip to Guadalajara and Puerto Vallarta to check on Colunga's sculptural progress, to my surprise, Memo and Margaret's daughter Cana, as well as Julio, tagged along. It was at that time that we became very close friends, which prompted me to invite Julio to come to New York City. Also at the end of 1982, I had settled into the New York City's art world and opened the Stelvex Gallery on Mercer Street in Soho. At that point, I reiter reiterated my invitation to Julio to come to New York City. 
I believe he arrived in 1983 and to my surprise asked to stay at my loft with his then partner Jesus. I was busy running the Selwyn Segui Gallery showing a number of artists from among the studio visits I did with my close friend Lowry Sims, a curator at the Metropolitan Museum. I began working with graffiti and street artists, a controversial decision as uptown collectors had not yet caught on to this downtown underground movement. And at some point, I introduced Lowry and Julio, who became fast friends, and several years later, she wrote an essay of Julio's first museum solo at Marco in September of 1987. Upon his arrival in New York City, Julio gifted me a small painting from his Arville show. He had carried it under his arm from Mexico, and I was very touched by the generosity. As I was curating an exhibition titled Soul Catchers at Stelvick City Gallery, I realized that this small painting fit perfectly into this overall curatorial script. When I told him the work would be included, Julio got very excited, knowing it would be his first inclusion in a New York City gallery show. The work depicted a bandaged figure sitting on a table as though a sculpture. And it had no legs and knives were stuck all over its body. Two arms covered the eyes of a bald-headed man or woman. In addition, Julio had attached two tin milagritos of the bleeding heart type. Milagritos are a popular art form used to express gratitude or request a miracle from your favorite virgin or saint and then taken to hang in chapels and churches all over Mexico. Julio's milagritos were sewn with string to the top left and top right of the canvas. The painting was allegorical and very soulful. I soon realized that Julio's work echoed the second generation of New York Fashionists in New York City, which in the early 80s was the heyday of this polymorphous painting style whose freewheeling strategies of collage, fragmentation, cultural borrowing, and dreamlike suspension were formulated by David Sally, Julian Schnabel, and Francesco Clemente, who in turn were influ influenced by Sigmar Polke. It seemed that Julio, already strongly inf influenced by the self-scrutiny of Frida Kahlo, filtered near expressionist less lessons through a personality and cultural heritage as polymorphous as the style. Throughout an astoundingly varied, often uneven range of images, he laced references of his childhood and his sexual identity with allusions to Catholicism, the Mexican Baroque, pre-Columbian cultures, retablos, and folk art. The result was a kind of postmodern symbolism, overripe, often perverse, yet mesmerizing. Their torturous dreamlike settings tended to be haunted by a handsome young man or boy child who strongly resembled himself. He underscored his preoccupation by painting himself in different roles. For example, hugging Jesus or as a Nino Dios or covering his eyes on top of a reclined veiled self-portrait. Julia told his mother I invited him to be my guest. Therefore, when she called and he wasn't there, I covered for him, inventing some excuse that he was taking a shower or he went to buy some food, which we needed, whatever. Domestic trivia to assure her that her son Julio was fine. Thank goodness, shortly thereafter, in the fall of 1984, or perhaps early 1985, he rented a studio apartment in Hell's Kitchen around West 42nd Street. And that's when his New York City period really began. The Soul, Ca Soul Catchers exhibition was a response to the controversial MoMA show Primitivism in the 20th Century Art. And more directly, I built on Thomas McEvely's art forum, November 1984, seminal critique of that show, which continues to resonate today. McEvely aptly titled his essay, Doctor, Lawyer, Indian Chief, pointing to MoMA's modernist canon. And I quote, the collection of the Museum of Modern Art is predominantly based on the idea that formalist modernism will never pass. 
will never lose its self-validating power. Not a relative, a conditioned thing, subject to transient causes and effects. It is to be above all the web of natural and cultural change. This is as it's supposed as essence. And after several years of sustained attack, such a creedy credo needs a defender and a new defense. How brilliant to attempt to revalidate classical modernism and modernist aesthetics by stepping outside their usual realm of discourse and bringing to bear about them a vast foreign sector of the world by demonstrating that the innocent creativity of primitives naturally expresses a modernist aesthetic feeling. One may seem to have demonstrated once again that modernism itself is both innocent and universal. And there was Julio's painting, smack in the middle of tribal objects such as a Haitian voodoo flag, a Dogon staff, an Apache spirit mask, and Vito Acconci's circular moving machines. Hannah Wilkie's chocolate body art, photographs and three of Joseph Boyce's felt suits, Anna Mendieta's pebble-framed silhouette photograph, several of Paul Theck's studies for his technological reliquaries, and then Marisol's bronze-like death mask with 28 dangling objects coming out of her skull, plus more and more. Thank you. Thank you.